Um, Lenny, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our people out in the West Coast. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, we are so excited. This is the first uh, of four uh, roundtable discussions that we will be doing every Friday throughout the month of, of, of June. Uh, sovereign bodies will be hosting these conversations. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask one of our panelists, uh, Moroni, to uh, open us up with a prayer. Thank, thank you, Lenny, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Moroni, and I'll introduce myself later, but I'll just start with a prayer. Um, we are grateful for uh, being gathered together as um, as indigenous people and as people who are concerned about the lives and healing of all those who have been impacted by violence, we ask that um, that we have our our spirits will be strengthened and that our minds will be open as we hear and listen with our hearts to one another, that we may take what we learn back to our homes and our communities, that we may bring healing and be a vessel of 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 happiness for others. And we um, <clears throat> ask creator that, that you watch over all of our black brothers and sisters now as they struggle for healing and for, and for justice. And we, we ask creator that you strengthen them and strengthen our resolve to stand with them. And we ask creator that you bless us with, with healing and clarity of mind and, and, um, and the ability to articulate thoughts in kind, compassionate ways. And we ask Creator that, that you watch over us and, and bless all of the participants. And, um, and we ask this, uh, Creator, um, and uh, ask this in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Moroni. So, um, Anita. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all of our panelists. We have a pretty star-studded group of folks who are going to share today. And thank you to anybody who's tuning in. Um, my name is Anita Lou Casey. I'm Executive Director of Sovereign Bodies Institute. And um, it's my pleasure to get to kind of uh, introduce SBI for a little bit before we launch into the discussion today. And um, really, it's an honor for SBI to get to host this discussion today. Um, when we first brought Lenny Hayes on to our staff um, to assist us in, in ensuring that our missing and murdered two-spirit relatives were being included in our data and um, included in all of our work, um, it was really um, it was really an amazing process for us of relationship building, and I've learned so much through that um, and learned so much from Lenny. Um, this uh, roundtable discussion is one of four we'll have this month, and um, one of a very long path ahead of working hard to ensure that our Two-Spirit and Native LGBTQ relatives are included um, and uh, are welcomed in our spaces. Um, and one of the things that um, Lenny and I initially bonded over was just how difficult it is to gather uh, data on violence against Two-Spirit people and especially missing and murdered Two-Spirit people. Um, because they're often misgendered in law enforcement records or it's not notated that they're LGBTQ. Um, and uh, it's, um, and sometimes our own communities don't always rally around them or um, fight for justice for them the way we do for others. So it really is an honor to open up the space today and um, to get to have SBI um, be part of opening up this dialogue across our movement and across our communities about how we can create better research and also a better movement um, that includes the experiences of our Two-Spirit and Native LGBTQ relatives. So thank you, Lenny, for putting this together and thank you to all of our panelists. I'm really excited for the rich discussion today. Thank you, Anita. Um, again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lenny Hayes, and I am part of SBI staff, and I'm just so excited that, and, and really blessed that I was able to meet Anita last October um, and was invited to be a part of SBI. Um, so my title with uh, SBI is I'm the Miss, uh, Missing and Murdered Two-Spirit Project Assistant. 
Um, and so again, you know, I'm just uh, just um, re uh, um, encouraging everyone today that this is a safe space. Um, we have not yet been able to um, really begin to have this conversation nationally. Um, we know that, uh, you know, I want to acknowledge all of our Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ individuals, groups, uh, communities that are doing work within their communities. But again, you know, um, it's just lack of uh, data and research and that's something we really need to talk about. So I want to encourage everybody to um, be respectful, uh, be mindful of what uh, um, you may ask if there's any questions that you want to ask but again this is the first time that we've ever really done something like this uh, nationally um, and so um, we just want to remind people to be compassionate and caring and respectful and loving to this community that we know is um, often a forgotten and underserved population so uh, as we begin, what I am going to do, first of all, is I want to introduce our panelists and say thank you from the bottom of my heart for agreeing to be a part of this uh, first roundtable discussion. Um, so I am going to start out with uh, Jessica Elm. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jessica Elm. I'm a citizen of the Oneida Nation and a descendant of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohicans. I'm really glad to be here today and I appreciate the invitation. Um, I also identify as a, as a two-spirit person and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University. However, I do live in um, Duluth, Minnesota right now. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Jessica Smith. Hey, everybody. My name is Jessica Smith. I am a student researcher at the University of Wisconsin Superior. Um, I am also on the SBI Survivor Leadership Council and their newest intern this summer. Um, I identify as a two spirit bisexual woman and I am an enrolled member of the Boys Sport Band in Minnesota. I live in Cloquet, Minnesota. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome. Uh, Moroni? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Moroni Benali. I'm Navajo Dene from uh, Northern Arizona. I currently live in Salt Lake City. I'm the coordinator for advocacy and public policy for Restoring Ancestral Winds, one of the, I guess, 18 tribal coalitions that work on sexual assault, domestic violence in Indian country. And I'm also finishing a PhD in public policy at the University of Washington in Seattle. I, and I also I identify as a two-spirit LGBTQ nuglehe, whatever one of those terms fits. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Moroni. Uh, Sarah. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah Deer. I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. I'm currently a professor at the University of Kansas where I teach in women, gender, and sexuality studies as well as the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Um, I am a cisgender um, straight woman and so I want to be cognizant of the space that I take up in this conversation, but I'm really thrilled to be invited and thank you Lenny and um, Anita for making this happen. Thank you, Sarah. So <clears throat> with that, um, what, am I, what I'm going to be doing now is that I'm going to be specifically asking questions to our panelists. Um, and we will have time at the end to um, uh, have the audience ask any questions to the panelists. Um, again, I want to remind people to be respectful when uh, uh, talking or asking questions to our panelists. So I'm gonna start out with Jessica Smith first. So here's your question to you, Jessica. As an identified bisexual two-spirit woman, how has your identity made you a bigger target for violence and trafficking? Uh, 
Uh, I think you're muted, Jessica. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Lenny. Uh, yeah, this is a tough question, and I was looking at it last night and even the day before you had sent it to me. And I'm trying to think about how to uh, put how I feel about this question and within my identity into words. And it's been quite difficult um, as a two-spirit bisexual indigenous woman. I feel as though bisexuals are a big target for traffickers. Um, I am a survivor of sex trafficking and I vaguely remember my grooming period, but throughout that, um, I remember when my trafficker got excited about my bisexuality. Um, I believe that they see that part of somebody's identity and it almost makes them um, easier to sexually exploit them, um, which makes them a bigger target. Um, my trafficker also had a female associate uh, that really kind of kept me comfortable and kept me in that situation longer, but she also kept me safe from a lot of things. So being a bisexual and being in a situation of trafficking like that can be difficult to get out um, just because uh, the connection with, with somebody who's in that same kind of position that you are, um, it almost creates a, like a type of fake safety net. And I've never thought about that until you asked me that question. Um, so it took me a couple days to kind of think about how I wanted to answer that. Um, and then when I think about violence uh, in my relationships and even with women, um, that violence has mostly come from friends and people that I trust. Um, so it's really hard for me to trust people these days. Um, intimate partner violence for me has only ever come from um, relationships with women. Aside from my trafficker, no man has ever hit me. Um, I have never allowed that type of violence because I grew up around so much domestic violence and watching my mother get abused so much, I, I kind of put a stand down that I'm not gonna ever accept that type of uh, abuse. So um, having get, being assaulted by women has made it more difficult um, for me to kind of heal and even just um, start to be comfortable with my entire, you know, my identity and my sexuality and incorporating that into healing. And I feel like this conversation is one that's needed to be needed to been had for a really long time because there is such a lack of, of services that um, are available for um, LGBTQ um, indigenous people. Um, so I am very glad that I'm able to be a part of this conversation. Um, I'm really nervous and I hope that I said everything that I wanted to say, um, that it came out right. Um, that's all I really have to say right now, Lenny, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I admire your courage. Um, I admire you that you are able to identify as a bisexual two-spirit woman um, because in the work that I've been doing across the country, educating our tribal communities about the violence within our community, um, you, we, we don't often get individuals who will come forward and say, um, I'm a survivor. Um, and so one of the things that I, that I feel that's really important is that our, our Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ community needs to hear that there is survivors out there and that we are impacted by many forms of violence. 
Um, we need to sort of create a safe space for them to come forward. But also too, I mean, we also need to be acknowledged within our tribal communities. And, um, you know, one of the things that I always say is that I admire uh, the native leaders across, native women leaders across the country who I have grown to adore and learn and grow with. Um, and so that's always been uh, my passion and my commitment that, that we need to start addressing these issues that are impacting our community. Um, as we know, we know specifically that, that we get shunned in our communities. Um, we are discriminated against in our own communities. Um, and we know that um, same-sex marriage is, is, is something that's not passed across the country. Um, so I really admire you and I thank you for uh, agreeing to be a part of this panelist. And I'm, I'm so looking forward to working with you more and um, just learning from you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on to our next panelist, uh, Jessica Elm. Um, so my question to you is, what is your thoughts on research and data on violence against two-spirit Native LGBTQ people? Um, what have you found or not found? And uh, what about this population in regards to the MMIW movement? Thank you, Lenny. Um, yeah. I mean, overall, there's just a huge need for more data, um, both quantitative and qualitative. Um, even really basic data set on de demographics is needed. So that can tell you how much you know, information we have on violence. Um, there's also not a lot of recent data. And um, one of the best studies, of course, is the Honor Project, but that was in 2005. One, one really good study, though, has been done more recently, and that was the U.S. Transgender Survey, led by Sandy James. Um, and, and he did a really good job of um, creating an advisory board and vetting the different survey items, um, really putting in a meaningful effort into choosing those items. So I recommend that as a resource. Um, and then, um, you know, sometimes we can do a secondary data analysis. However, um, this is often not appropriate because the survey items have not been vetted or they're not appropriate. They don't capture the full lived experience of two-spirit people. So that's uh, problematic. Um, and then back, uh, back in the good old days when we had a different administration, um, at one time, the feds were collecting um, sexual orientation and gender identity data, but I am not clear on whether that's still happening now. Um, and so then another issue, um, of course, you, you kind of touched upon this, Lenny, um, that some tribes don't want their two-spirit data to be made public. So we have some evidence that, um, you know, in one data set that I'm familiar with um, about suicide attempts and um, two spirits have a higher um, risk for that within this one uh, tribal community. However, that community does not want to, again, make that public. And so it just really speaks to um, just the work we need to do uh, to decolonize some communities or the people in that community. Um, of course, we need to lead that. Um, and because, you know, we, um, we try to do really rigorous and respectful research, we have to honor those um, things. And it just really, it's just another barrier um, for information to be out there. Um, I do understand that there's some um, qualitative um, studies going on that are small, um, but are, again, much needed. Um, because we need just some really, um, you know, in-depth understanding of what the lived experience is. Um, yeah, and again, just going back to the Honor Project, we are still publishing off that data, um, led by Karina Walters, and, um, and I'll be sharing some of that data today um, in a minute. Uh, I think the the 
um, another issue is that folks just don't understand the, or they're unaware of sort of the protocols that are necessary when we're doing research in the university setting. They might know a little bit more now because of the processes going on with the vaccine, but you know, you hear, oh, it takes this many years to get a vaccine trial done. And a lot of that has to do with um, institutional re review boards. And um, it's even slower in tribal communities because we have to, of course, get permission from um, tribal council, et cetera, unless we're working in urban communities. So um, sometimes it's just easier to do research outside of the university setting. However, funds for that are really limited. Um, can you repeat the other questions, Lenny? Yeah. Sure, most definitely, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so the other question, and I do want to do a follow-up question after this one. Um, so what is your thoughts about uh, this population, the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ community in regards to the MMIW movement? What do you think needs to happen? Um, you know, just, just your thoughts. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of really amazing work going on, um, including from some of our panelists here. Um, and we need more funding to do that and keep it going. I also think there's some um, needs that need to be met within this movement. And essentially it comes down to um, being more inclusive. Um, I think one way that we can do that is to come together, all the people working on this issue and form a set of values um, that can be foundational across all the smaller movements and to have people sign on or agree to these values in order to have some sort of platform to move from. And within that process of deciding what our values are, we of course would um, incorporate a lot of traditional values and inclusive values and honor to spirit people. So that is one thing that I think we could do as a solution. Um, and another point I would just like to make is that as Native people, we all move through the world knowing that feeling of being marginalized because we're such a small you know, number in the population. And then when you get a lot of Native people together, there's often another group that is marginalized within our own population. And oftentimes that's two-spirit people. And so I think it's important for all Native people to consider that and just remember what our experiences are and how we may be discriminating against other people in different forms, but in this case, um, for two-spirit people. Um, I also think it's, uh, speaking from like with my research hat on, I think it's important to create safe spaces for Two-Spirit people to talk about their experiences. Of course, some people are not out. Some people are um, just are afraid of sharing because they've had um, bad experiences when they've shared before. Um, and so creating that safe space is another first step that needs to happen to expand our research. I think also, um, Jessica, you kind of touched on this, is that we need to move beyond just awareness and we need more, mo more knowledge about what resources are out there. Um, there's just a need for really basic things that often happen like in the intimate partner violence world where we need um, social support like if we're going to um, a court hearing or something like that. So I just, my vision would be to move beyond kind of the awareness campaigns. Um, yeah, and I've had my own experiences with this and trying to find resources. 
um, and it's even in the place where I live now where it's supposedly so progressive and inclusive, it's really difficult to, um, you know, even find a therapist that knows about severe trauma. And you wouldn't, you know, that's even without me bringing anything, anything specific up. So there's just a need to help identify those, those people that we can go to. Um, I think uh, for me personally, it's really difficult to see smaller groups of people kind of jump into the movement briefly and then jump back out. And I think that's happening because this is like the, sec the sexy thing to do right now is be in the movement of MMIW. And um, I just want to say that's really hurtful. And sometimes groups um, put together a public health campaign or they do different things without vetting their ideas or um, being inclusive and they do harm. And um, another thing I would hope for in the future is that when people go off and do their own rogue things, if they would vet their ideas with other people and make sure they're not doing harm before they move forward. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it, Lenny. Um, so what I'm going to do really quickly, because we have some audience members who don't know what MMIW means. So um, I wanted to ask Sarah if she would be willing to um, let the audience know. Sure, I'm happy to take that. So MMIW um, stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Um, it's a hashtag and a rallying um, sort of cry, um, which actually had its origins in Canada. Um, about 15 years ago, there was a grassroots movement that developed national attention around missing and murdered indig Indigenous women. Um, and for some reason, it didn't really stick in the United States until more recently. Um, I think one of the challenges that we'll talk about um, it, at some point today is, you know, what do we do with the 2S, right? So I've seen now MMIW2S, but the question is, is that just a tat, is that somebody just throwing that on the end, or is there really engagement with a two-spirit community in the MMIW work? Um, there's national work, there's local work, there's tribal work, um, but, but basically, yeah, that's missing and murdered Indigenous women. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so with the follow-up, Jessica, what I wanted to ask you, um, well, first of all, I wanna thank you um, as, as a friend of mine and as an amazing colleague and someone who I learn a lot from also. Um, one of the things that I, and we know that there is within the, I know a lot of people don't like when this phrase is said, but in the mainstream LGBTQ community, we know that there is data and research in regards to um, uh, people who identify as LGBTQ. Now, I've been in many areas and um, have asked a question when I've seen this data um, in regards to the many different forms of violence that impacts this population. Um, but when I've asked um, the question, how much of that data is Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ, a lot of times no one would answer that question because I, I mean, um, personally and professionally, I believe that the questions are not properly asked. Um, maybe that's not written down. I don't know. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. That's a great question. Well, I think when, when any of us do research, there's always bias, even if it's at the very beginning when we ask our research questions. The way we do that is um, we choose one thing, which means we're leaving out other things. And even if we do do things correctly or the best way that we know um, and ask the right questions on our surveys, um, it's still the choice of researchers that analyze that data, whether they want to um, report out on that or not. Because um, typically it's several people that publish off a data set like that. So it's, um, we need more two-spirit researchers, for sure. 
and we need to support them getting through their PhD programs. Um, it's also just really hard. I mean, I, I consider myself um, a researcher of the risk factors that um, lead to increased risk for um, being missing or murdered. And in that sense, I study a lot of child maltreatment. And it's really difficult to kind of move through that um, alone. And so um, I'm always looking for co-authors. Um, yeah, I forgot what your question was, but does that answer it? Yeah, you did a really good job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, but we know that there's lack of, you know, and that's one of, I think, one of the most important things that uh, we can take away from this first conversation is that there is lack of data and research in all forms of violence that impacts the uh, Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ community. So again, thank you, Jessica. Um, so I'm going to move on now um, to Moroni. Um, I just, I adore you, Moroni. Um, I love the work that you do. Um, so one of the things that I would like to ask you is, um, first of all, tell us about your work in Utah. Um, what were some of your struggles and challenges working to get the identity of the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ uh, to be included in regards to the MMIW movement? Right. Um, and second, okay, I'll let you, I'll, and then I'll, I'll ask the following questions after that. I know that was a big question. Well, thank you, Lenny. I adore you too. And I'm just honored to be with the rest of the panelists who are um, just, I admire all the work that you all do as well. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, I started working with Restoring Ancestral Winds and doing the policy work. Um, and we started thinking through the murder missing indigenous and what, and started looking at just specifically at looking at like the specific pathways of for like internet part, intimate, uh, intimate partner violence and other types of violences could potentially be pathways that lead to this, to the ultimate end of this crisis. And one of those that we kept thinking, and because I'm two spirit, I kept thinking is like, how do we include um, LGBTQ Nagleha or the two spirit mm -hmm. into this process? Um, and the big challenge that we had in Utah, um, well, first of all, there are eight federally recognized tribes in Utah for those who don't know. Um, and there is about approximately 70,000 uh, Native Americans, at least according to the census, that live in the state of Utah. So it's not just all white Mormons. <laughs> we, we are, some of us are still here on our ancestral lands. Um, but part of what we had had to deal with was was a lot of education about just, I mean, starting with just what, uh, just, just about, uh, about being gay, what that means. Um, and we had to explain and sit and learn and, and, and uh, teach a lot of these legislators and agency heads, just basically what that means that, uh, that gay people, that's what they understood at the time, um, were deserving of of rights that they they, they are they had that these inherent human rights and then we slowly started introducing this idea and concept of two spirit which confused them nonetheless and so we had to spend a lot of time <laughs> spending a lot of time um working to uh, increase the level of understanding of what two spirit means because for whatever reason um the gay lgbtq didn't quite um in, in a lot of the, their understanding didn't quite match uh, when we said two spirit because I uh, it just maybe maybe it was a bit ambiguous so we spent a lot of time talking about that and one of the first documents that we had used was um, when I was director of the net policy institute at the net college years ago we did one of the we did a, a, a sort of like a an informal study of of uh, data collection of of, of Nuklehe or LGBTQ in Navajo, in the Navajo, just specifically within the Navajo Nation. And if I, if my, if I can share this screen, I'll just show you the infographic that we produced from that. Um, I can't share it, Lenny, but um, I, so 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 what we found, what that found, we we had about a close to a hundred respondents from that from that, and what we found uh, is within a six month period. 40% of the respondents had received threats of physical violence. 60% uh, of them 
hid their sexuality. This is just within a six month period. 70% were verbally abused within a six month period. 20% were sexually, sexually assaulted within that six month, within a six month period. 20, Rona, 20%. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, I think you're able to share your screen now, if you'd like. Oh, yes, there it is. Perfect. Okay, can you see that now? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is what we found from that. And so we had used these numbers um, to start basically humanizing um, uh, LGBTQ two-spirit for, for a lot of the people that we were uh, engaged with. And, and this was just, what we did was we did a lot of this, this work to um, get them comfortable including LGBTQ or two-spirit into just a resolution to proclaim May 5th as MMIW Awareness Day. And there was a lot of work that we had to do just to get them beyond um, their understanding and perception of what uh, LGBTQ, gay, or two-spirit meant. But eventually, using these numbers, they began to recognize, oh, yeah, there are, there are specific violence targeted towards these groups. And eventually, the resolution that we had, um, had worked on had passed the Utah legislature. And so we felt like that was a good start just to get um, our legislators and, 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 and other folks in Utah comfortable with this idea of Two-Spirit uh, being included within this larger um, movement of MMIW. And so then it took, and then we went, and then we had another full year where we then started working more on um, understanding the LGBTQ um, and two-spirit portion. And so we, we had convened a few small focus groups um, to, with, uh, with two-spirit uh, individuals in, in, in Utah and Salt Lake City, where we had these sort of focus, that we had these focus groups with some, some specific questions um, and 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 their experiences that came out of them, we recorded them, um, and we started using their experiences and and whatever qualitative data we we got from that to start buttressing and start really giving form and just again humanizing the two because they, they were very comfortable with the idea of of violence against women and girls and even violence against uh, men. One of them brought that up in one of our committee meetings, uh, one of the uh, standing committee meetings of legislature. Um, but they but they were still uncomfortable with the two spirit LGBTQ part, and so so with that we had to then start um, uh, working with the Utah Pride Center, um, other organizations that that had done work around uh, just LGBTQ issues, um, and we even sat with some of these large conservative organizations that we knew that that um, that that we knew that we needed their support to move this legislation forward. And we again sat with this, with this, um, with these numbers, which is really all we had. And we had the numbers from the transgender study as well. Um, but a lot of the questions that we want, a lot of what we wanted was we wanted to show, even though the the, the numbers are imperfect, the way the data collect was collected with the the net college uh, data was was not entirely uh, perfect. But it's the best that we had at the time that was very specific to a tribe. And once we were able to share that and then uh, add that to, um, to, to the qualitative data that we got from our two-spirit focus groups, we were then able to really start talking about the experiences and able to start sort of localizing or, or making, uh, or, or homing in on like, uh, on the unique um, experiences of two-spirit in regards to this larger crisis of, of, of of the MMIW uh, um, uh, movement. And so was that, that's kind of what we did. And so there's a lot of challenges, just very slow moving and a lot of, a lot of patience, a lot of prayers, and a, a lot of uh, just, a lot of education is, is what we did. We, in every workshop, every um, uh, training that we did, we always included this element of two-spirit. And uh, always try to make it a sticking point uh, for for individuals who are uncomfortable with even just including that. Um, but eventually, we, we were able to get get uh, get the legislature to pass a, 
the task force right now, and the task force is really looking at how can we figure out, how can we focus our efforts to also really include Two-Spirit in terms of data collection, law enforcement data collection, in terms of policy formulation, in terms of, of just a, a number of other elements as well. And so, um, so that's kind of like the story behind how we sort of work through um, the state of Utah around this. And we're still working with them. We still have to sit down and explain what two-spirit means um, to, a lot of, to a lot of people. And also we still have to break down the entire acronym of LGBTQ, like what that means as well to individuals. And so, um, so oftentimes we just have to accept once they get that they're within this realm of gay, we're like, oh, given where they're at, that's probably the best we can do right now. Um, but, but we've been making some, some very good strides and we, we are partnering with a number of organizations. Um, and a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is really focusing in on um, developing uh, 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 research and, and data collection instruments so we can better understand uh, what's going on within our two-spirit communities, specifically what's going on around um, their understanding of their own targeting as targets of violence, but also uh, what's happening in just their experiences, um, uh, just in general, because um, we don't have a lot of data, as, as it was noted before. Um, so that's kind of where, 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 how, how we engage the state of Utah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Morona, I have a question from what you just presented from the audience member. So the question is, are the 6% being denied medical services on the reservation or are they being denied at non-tribal clinics? The Indian Health Service is in the reservation, in the Navajo Nation, yeah. And, the, and, and if, I re, if I recall the data, I don't have all of it in front of me, most of those that, that most of the 6% were, uh, are transgender um, dinner relatives that, that felt they were being denied services or that stated they were being denied services. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Moroni. Um, just thank you for all the work you've done and just being a strong leader for our community. Um, I just admire you and, and I'm hoping to work more with you in the future. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to move on to Jessica. Uh, and I'm, uh, I would also like to ask you two questions from the audience, if possible. But uh, my question to you, Sarah, as a strong Native woman leader, what advice can you give us as a population that is working to be recognized in a movement of missing and murdered? Um, what can you share in your work? Well, thank you again for having me. Um, my role here is um, uh, somewhat tangential to the work being done by Two-Spirit researchers, and I don't want to take up that space and claim to be, um, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I want to check my privilege, I guess is what I want to say. Um, so I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer by training, um, and typically attorneys are not empiricists. Um, we don't learn that skill set in law school unless we do a dual degree with some other social sciences. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's not a skill set that I developed as a student um, and as an attorney. Um, one of the things though, that I've noticed, and I've been um, working on national legislative fixes for the past, say, 15, 20 years, um, is that percentages and numbers matter to legislators. Um, you know, I can go in with uh, one story and it will be sort of characterized as anecdotal. And so for right or wrong, in order to get things like the Violence Against Women Act passed, um, we have to come in with all of these horrible dehumanizing numbers. Um, but I can tell you that that's what moves legislators, um, you know, and so it's hard because on the one hand, you know, these numbers tend to um, compel legislators to action, but it's also very dehumanizing. And then along with that, we don't have the data um, about two-spirit people and, and native LGBTQ people who are experiencing violence. Like we do have some localized and longitudinal studies, but how it really intersects with MMIW is still sort of, um, pre sort of premature, I think. 
So um, I decided to, to develop a research project um, that looked at the question of justice for survivors, um, partly because I'm a, a lawyer. Um, and I think it's really an interesting question to ask what, if you have been a victim of a, of a violent act or a series of violent acts, uh, what would you like to see happen in your community in response to that violence? Um, and this question became more difficult as I started and more timely for, for our, where we are in, 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 in our um, nation right now um, is um, how, uh, you know, we, do we really want the police and the courts to, to respond to the violence that happens to us because many people are re-victimized by that system? Um, and so what else would justice look like if we didn't have police and we didn't rely on prosecutors to, to for our justice? So the research project that I have developed is called the Native Justice Project. And um, we have interviewed um, over 50 Native people who have survived some form of violence. And we recruited um, in person and did some snowball sampling. And then we have done um, uh, social media announcements. And so what we've done is, this is for me, this is the qualitative piece that I've been waiting for because I've been using these numbers forever. You know, 86% of Native women have been victimized by violence. And I've repeated those numbered, numbers ad nauseum um, to people in power. Um, but this time the question is, if you have been a survivor, what do you want to see happen in your community? Um, and so in doing that, our flyers included uh, that we were interested in talking to Two-Spirit LGBTQ people. And I've come to understand that that's important because oftentimes Two-Spirit people, when they see a flyer and it doesn't specify um, their identity, then they feel maybe that that research project is not something they would be welcomed in. Um, so it's a preliminary step. And we're still in the process of analyzing the data. Um, we're using Atlas um, to um, pull out the qualitative themes that we're seeing. And so it's a little premature for me to give you any kind of, um, uh, any kind of uh, conclusions because we're still in fairly early in the process of coding. Um, but the goal here again is to say, as a two-spirit person, whether you live on reservation, off reservation, if you are victimized by someone, a native, non-native, or otherwise, what what do you desire to see as a, as a as a an intervention to that? And so I'm looking forward to being able to articulate that what that is, especially in this time when we are so critical of police and so critical of the police state and the carceral. Um, the carceral state as well. Can we find justice outside of those schematics or are we stuck with that? So I think that that is a summary of what I'm working on now. And I'm working with a really great graduate student who is um, also doing her own research in her own community um, about the similar issues. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering if you can answer this question for us. Um, what can law enforcement do to support Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people? And what do you want law enforcement to know and or look for? I'm not sure if you're able to answer that question. Who, who would you like to have answer that? Um, uh, Anita. Excuse me, sorry, Sarah. Um, hi, this is Anita. Sorry, I don't have my video on because my computer almost died and I'm in a less glamorous part of my house, <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> um, I think uh, important question and, um, you know, it, like, I, I think it's challenging for me to answer because I don't identify as a two-spirit person. Um, but what I can say just in my experience in working with law enforcement is that, um, most law enforcement, especially if they're um, not tribal law enforcement, are really kind of ignorant on Native peoples in general. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation and um, myths that, um, that, and, that they bring into their work because they're not properly trained on how to work with Indigenous communities. And then that gets compounded 
uh, in the case of two spirit victims because it's totally out of their wheelhouse and they're not trained on it at all. Or if they are, the training is clearly inadequate. Um, we had a situation come up um, actually at the SBI office a couple months ago where we had two indigenous women come to us um, who were two spirit and in a romantic relationship. And um, one of them was um, physically disabled and was sexually assaulted. Um, and uh, because she was alone in her tent um, at, as an unsheltered woman and, and someone took advantage of that and hurt her. And when we tried to make referrals to appropriate services, whether it was with law enforcement or even um, like the local rape crisis uh, center, um, we even have, um, you know, in, indigenous specific resources here. There was no, no one knew what to do with either one of them. Um, and they weren't willing to part ways and have one of them go into a transitional shelter and not bring the other one with her. Um, and they had no protocol for how to house um, two people who were in a romantic relationship together. Um, and so what ended up happening is that that woman actually didn't receive any support or services um, because no one was equipped to provide that to her. And both of those women are still unsheltered. Um, so it's that was a really you know, big learning moment for me was that even people who you would think would be trained and to provide that level of care and those services, even if they're not law enforcement, um, it just doesn't exist. And they'll use things like, um, you know, funding constraints to say, well, you know, she was abused because um, because she was two spirit. The other the other woman was unsheltered because she had been kicked out of her home because she was two spirit. Um, and so they wouldn't take her um, because it wasn't intimate partner violence, it was family violence and their grant funding didn't cover that. And there was just so many bureaucratic loopholes. It was such a mess that both of those women went completely unserved. Um, so I think I'm hoping that example can illustrate why it's important for not just law enforcement, but service providers to really critically look at their capacity to serve two spirit victims of violence. Thank you, Anita. Anita, I'm wondering if you can also um, answer this question or anybody else that's on a panel. Um, so what connection does MMIR slash P have with human trafficking and what should we know about Two-Spirit Native LGBT, LGBTQ people experiencing human trafficking? This is Anita. I'm going to speak to it really briefly, and then I think um, both Moroni and, and Jessica would be um, really great speakers to touch on this. Um, just in working with the data, a large number of the missing and murdered um, two-spirit relatives who are in the database are um, victims of trafficking or were involved in survival sex work. Um, and unfortunately, that's really the only time that media um, consistently covers those cases and is when there's kind of a, um, a spectacle factor to it. Um, and oftentimes there's really offensive language um, because typically it's trans women who are involved in survival sex work. Um, and it's kind of uh, reported on more as a spectacle than, um, than a humanizing narrative that says, hey, we've lost someone of great value to our community. Um, so, uh, I think that's, uh, that's one of the major issues I see in the data uh, around the intersection of trafficking or survival sex work um, and, and our two-spirit relatives. But I want to invite both Moroni and Jessica Smith to speak to this as well. Thank you, Anita. <clears throat> OK, um, so like I was saying earlier about the lack of support really for two-spirit um, Native LGBTQ um, survivors and um, people who are even still, like Anita was saying, um, in survival sex work. Uh, there, it just really is like just a lack of support um, tailored specifically to us. Um, I feel like we're kind of um, an invisible population inside an invisible population. So it makes it even worse um, when trying to get out of these situations because there is really no um, help. So that's something that 
as a researcher and as a survivor um, that I'm starting to take on, on that issue. Um, it's an issue that even um, within myself that I'm trying to, to still heal from um, because I never did get any type of therapy or anything like that um, after leaving that situation. So um, I'm still really um, early on in my research uh, and um, I'm hoping to keep bringing light to this topic. I'm really thankful for, for this webinar to start this topic and this conversation because it's very long overdue and it's very much needed. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I, I, I agree with both Jessica and, and Anita um, in, in how Two Spirits are, are Two Spirit is included in this MMIR um, and and how that intersects with trafficking. And I, I really agree that that framing is one of the how law enforcement and others frame um, Two Spirit um, is is critical to the way that they formulate policies as well. Um, and, and the way that Anita had framed it as, as a lot of these two-spirit tra are, are, are trans uh, brothers and sisters, native trans brothers and sisters, they're framed as spectacles. And it's only oftentimes in that moment that they receive some attention and, and also services because mm -hmm. they're being highlighted as, as a spectacle. And what we're trying to do is get away from that and um, and to really show like a lot of these, I think it was Jessica Elm that talked about a lot of the, I think she, her expertise is in risk factors. So please correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, but what we're trying to do is look at these risk factors first and say, well, here are the specific risk factors of our two-spirit people and why, and, and this is why we can, in, this is what we can infer as to why they become targets of violence. Um, and part of the work that we're doing, we look at that as well as is, is, is see that there is a lot of work that, I mean, a lot of, a lot of them are, are, do a lot of survival sex work. I just talked with um, a, a two-spirit not too long ago that I've been working with who, who is in that situation. And, um, and, and, that, and it's, just, it's, it's just the survival part of it. And, and we do what we can to help in those situations. And then there's others who are just, um, who, who feel... Um, not accepted within their own indigenous spiritual communities as well. And that's something that we're working on. I recall in a, one of our focus groups last year, one of our uh, participants had talked about sitting within in a sweat lodge and being openly um, harassed and discriminated against by the medicine men leading the ceremony in that sweat lodge. And so when we look at those, at those things, we, we've, we, we then start thinking, well, of course, we've got law enforcement and all this to deal with, but we have our own community and our own community traditions that we have to then start working with. And so, so the work that we're doing is trying to figure out how do we work with our traditional elders and, and our own community to get back to the way that we saw, that, as Native people, that we saw um, the Two-Spirit. Um, and so, so I, there, there's just a lot of different elements, but I think the framing thing that Anita focused in on is, is one of the most critical ways of either uh, silencing and erasing or bringing attention, um, even when it's under the guise of a spectacle. Mm -hmm. um, Marona, I really like what you just said, but also too, I mean, I think a, a lot of us who are doing this work in regards to violence, just against anybody, but you know, right now we're specifically talking about the spirit native LGBTQ community. And one of the things that I have said within tribal communities is the, the fact that we need to stop dehumanizing this population, you know, in regards to, um, you know, and one of the things that, that has been on my mind for, uh, for such a long time is like, you know, um, when are we going to get to a point that we who identify are human beings, but yet we're identified by our sexual orientation. You know, so that's my hope and dream of all this work that, you know, I, I, um, 
I adore all of our two spirit people, native LGBTQ people across the country who are breaking down barriers. Um, and we need to continue breaking down more barriers within our tribal communities and even nationally when it comes to that national data, because we don't know specifically the violence that's impacting this community. So I just, re I really want to thank you for all the work that you've done and are doing. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is um, I want to give about 10 minutes for any of the panelists, if they have any follow up uh, comments or remarks that they would like to say. And then I'm going to move on to um, questions that were asked by the audience. So I'm going to open that up now for all of you panelists, if there's any comments or any remarks that you would like to. Okay, Sarah? Well, I just want to make sure that we're not um, missing this part of the conversation, which is when um, a, a group, whether it's a grassroots group or a 501c3 or a national advocacy organization, um, and we're using the term MMIW, um, and, and that 2S, right, is attached to the end of it, um, is that being done in a, in a good way? Is it being slapped on there to look more inclusive? Or is that organization or um, support group or whatever the, you know, whatever kind of animal it is, um, are they really engaging with the voices of two-spirit people or is it just being slapped on to look more inclusive? And I think we have to talk about that. Thank you so much, Sarah. Any other thoughts and comments from the panelists? Um, in response to that, I think that a lot of people have been adopting even just the MMIP um, because, because of that reason exactly, that the 2S is just kind of slapped on at the end. And even for myself, in my um, research study that I'm doing right now, I just, you know, I realized like I did, I got the title wrong, like I just got it approved by the IRB, so I don't know if that's something that needs to be changed, but, and I was reading your book, Sarah, and like I'm using the word epidemic, and I got the that in the title, so now I'm kind of like second guessing myself and, and um, really trying to figure out how, what's the best way to go about this, and um to make sure that, you know, it is inclusive and it's not harmful um, in any way. So I think that's a really good point that you're making about the 2S just kind of being slapped on at the end. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can add to this. One of the things that, that, we're, that we're trying to do is we're trying to be very conscious, and I'm glad that Sarah brought this up, of of including the two-spirit. And one of the things that, that we are having a conversation with not only here, but with a number of other uh, organizations throughout uh, the Great Basin area that we work in, is whether or not when we say murder missing indigenous people, does that erase the two spirit and the importance of that as well? And so, so we're having these conversations of like, what's the best way that we move forward that is actually that that is inclusive and and recognizes uh, uh, these victims and and the and the violence that they experience? And so. So, so that's a really good question, Sarah, and I, I, I appreciate you bringing it up because we're, we're grappling with it. Yes, yeah. You know, and I think, you know, from uh, the many conversations that I've had with individuals who identify as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ, I think that we even struggle within our own community understanding uh, human trafficking and understanding um, uh, missing and murdered because, again, um, there's not a safe space for us to have those conversations. Um, you know, in my conversations with, um, with individuals who identified, my colleagues and my friends, one of the questions I asked them was, do you feel like we are part of the MMIW movement? Um, and I will be very honest, every individual who I asked who identified did not know how to answer that question because we've never been included. And so, um, you know, that was, that was very powerful. It, and it also made me sad too that, you know, um, we know that that's happening. We know 
that our community members who identify know of missing and murdered individuals, but yet we haven't like even begun to start to even collect more data. Does that make sense? So, you know, and that's something to really think about. Um, so I, I want to ask the panelists again if there's any comments or remarks that you would like to make. I can just share some data that I haven't published yet, if that's OK. Um, this is from the honor project data that I mentioned. That study ended in 2005. Um, and again, um, I study more of the risk factors uh, to becoming missing or murdered. And let's see. Um, so I looked at child maltreatment um, among two spirits, and I found that there was um, really high exposure, of course, or experiences of um, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. But even um, when it came to severe forms of abuse, those rates were really high too. So for example, for physical abuse, 65% of the sample experienced physical abuse and 32% of the sample experienced physical, physical abuse. And then for sexual abuse, 69% um, experienced sexual abuse and 46% um, experienced severe forms. And so we know when you, um, we know from the general literature that once you are um, sexually abused, you have a lot more um, risk for that occurring again um, later in life or even again in childhood um, because predators somehow know this um, and know how to pick out their victims. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jessica. Well, since you're right there, Jessica, I would like to ask you a question from the audience, and I and I hope that you're able to answer it. Um, so, how do we support the needs of two spirit relatives seeking addiction treatment who are experiencing structural violence from Western medicine providers, and also within their own community for for being uh, on treatment? I don't know if you're able to answer that question. Or that's a really big question, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's, that's a hard one. Um, I would say that um, we need more peer support, um, that we as um, Two-Spirit people have a responsibility to help those who maybe not, maybe they're not as privileged as we are. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I, I feel like there's so much movement happening right now about knowledge being gained about structural racism. And I want to see other people, like white people, pick up this issue and kind of take it to the next level. Not to say that they would do that for two-spirit people, but, but perhaps there's um, a little bit of momentum right now. And um, some of us could you know, advocate for those systems to be more inclusive. Thank you, Jessica. Um, again, I just want to give a, a couple more minutes. Does any of the panelists want to respond or should we move on? Any comments? All right then. Um, so we, <laughs> I'm so grateful that we have a lot of questions that are coming in and um, I'm not sure if we're able to answer all those questions. So I just, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, you know, again, this is our first time having this, this type of an event. So, of course, we're going to have a lot of questions. And, um, and our hope at Sovereign Bodies is that by having this event that we can spark more conversation. Um, you know, the need, the need for this community not to be forgotten anymore and to be served properly. So... Again, so I'm gonna, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into some of the questions that are coming through. Some of them are quite long. Um, so, all right. 
please be patient with me. There's all kinds of chats coming through. Um, this is a question. There seems to be so much confusion, mostly by outsiders, uh, non-native people, about the differences between transgender and two-spirit identity. Does this conflation of categories impact data collection? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I think a lot of us are laughing just because we know like how complicated that is. Like, like in Navajo, there are four different genders, and I think there's actually more, um, and none of them necessarily fit within the concept of the two-spirit. And so, it, it, so when you use that as a researcher to create a, a, a to operationalize that, um, you're assuming that everyone has a common reference of what that might mean across all 500 and some odd tribes. And mm -hmm. so, so you might have someone whose tribe that may, they, like Navajo, if someone can interprets Nuglaha as like, the Nuglaha literally means changing or fluid. And they're like, oh yeah, well, that means that I'm transgender and two-spirit means just gay and Nuglaha means gay and something like that. But then when we start drilling in to determine whether looking at violence against transgender versus those other, that category complicates that and we can't really necessary make inferences about specifically transgender. And so I think this is a long conversation about how, how we really clarify um, that concept, even just, just for measurement purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think too, um, and I don't know if you uh, panelists can agree with me on this, but I, I think sometimes too, is that often we get a lot of non-native non individuals who don't understand that the concept two-spirit was a concept that was created by native people and should only be used by native people. Um, and so, and, and I think often sometimes too, we get, the difficulty of getting non-native people to understand that the, the two-spirit two concept is a concept that it's a universal concept, right? But we have what, over 570 some tribes in the country and each tribe specifically has their own idea of what that two-spirit identity means, right? So one of the things that as part of my work that I do is that I remind people that the two-spirit concept was a concept that came about in 1990. And I feel really honored that I have, have met some of the elders who were part of that movement when that term first came about. But one of the things that I also remind people about is the fact that, um, and it really makes me sad because in some of the trainings that I've done nationally in tribal communities is that I have asked that question to communities to sort of have them set, uh, take a step back from the beliefs of today, but to go back thinking about their own cultural perspective. Like, so the question that I usually ask people um, in tribal communities is, do you know the word in your language that would identify someone like me? You know, and, that, and that's very powerful. And it may also makes me sad too that a lot of tribal communities don't know their word. And in my response, I always say, that is the impact of historical trauma on this population. Because from my own visiting with Two-Spirit elders and other people in community, um, we did have a word in our language. Um, but it was lost. And so it's kind of like reminding people and getting people to like take a step back and look at, well, how is this individual um, honored and respected in your community? What do you know about them? Going back to all that, those teachings. So um, 
I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, is there any, any of you panelists want to, um, any comments or remarks of what has been said so far? I'll just make one brief comment, kind of follow up on that. Um, like I was saying earlier, if, you know, we're all native, you know, we're as native people, we walk through the world in a certain way and we're marginalized. And then when you're a two spirit person, you're also marginalized. But like one of the stories we heard, um, you know, you can also have other identities that make you even more marginalized. So I just want to reiterate that it's more than just being inclusive of two spirit people, but we have to think about people with disabilities or other um, types of diversity. Um, that should be included in this movement. All right. Um, there is a question. Um, is anyone aware of current research projects studying Native trans people? I'm not. A, I'm not aware of any. Um, but certainly, there's work being done, uh, especially by students coming up through master's programs and things like that. There may be things going on even locally. Some shelter programs and service programs are doing their own research locally, but I can't give you the name or the name of a research or anything in particular. I haven't, I haven't heard of anything. That doesn't mean it's not happening. I know that the, um, the US Trans Survey does have a really great data set in my opinion, they did the questions the best that I've seen um, regarding identifying, you know, different types of trans people and the diversity within that. And I believe uh, you can use the data if you have, uh, if you make a request. And so there's that opportunity also. Okay. Um, there was a message that came through our response. Andrew Jolovit said, Irene Vernon is doing one research, but not sure about the status of it. So at least we know that it's happening. Um, so this is a very long question. Um, so the opiate crisis has really forced kinship. Uh, grandparents to take care of children whose parents are in treatment. Oftentimes, it's difficult for grandparents to understand the experiences of 2S questioning and native LGBTQ plus youth. Has there been any efforts to support grandparents taking care of non-binary children? That's a really long. <laughs> Who uh, wants to talk? Yes. Lenny, when I was still in Minnesota at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, can you remind me of the organization that would periodically have events um, at the law school regarding foster parents? Um, I can't remember the name of the organizers, but is that um, a training program that had uh, touched on this for foster parents in particular? Um, yes. Uh, uh, Sandy Whitehawk. Yes. would uh, in June of every year, she would host uh, Indian Child Welfare Association um, uh, conference, one day conference specifically on issues and uh, of two-spirit people. Uh, specifically, we would talk about uh, youth in foster care. Um, well, I mean, that's a really, I mean, I could answer that question just because of my experience in doing child welfare work and being a part of different things nationally. One of the things that I know of is that um, our Indian people mean well when they take our children in. One of the questions that has been repeatedly asked to me um, is, well, how do you know when a child is coming out? Um, my response to that question is, is that if a child is not in a safe space, if there's homophobic uh, slur remarks that are being used, um, and often too what we know is that um, perpetrators um, will groom specifically a child who may identify. We know that that happens. Um, but if a child is not who's in foster care, um, is not in a safe space, 
and that child who identifies uh, is going to run to the streets and become a bigger target for victimization. So one of the things that I know that, um, that I've had many conversations with different organizations is, uh, as part of my advocacy work is that we need to have a specific curriculum developed for native foster parents of youth who identify as Two-Spirit or native, native LGBTQ. My frustration is, is that we know that there is uh, LGBTQ curriculum out there specifically, but it's not specific to our Native people and our Native youth who identify. Um, so, you know, that's something that, that needs to be done. Um, because again, we have to understand how historical trauma, how colonization has impacted this community specifically. You know, um, we have a lot of our elders in our community who still do they're still, um, and, I'm, and I mean that in the most respectful way, is that they don't understand, but what they were taught by uh, the church, by religion. And so they look down on um, our young people who identify. Um, so, you know, and I'm gonna give you a really, uh, an example. Um, so I was a therapist uh, consultant for, a native organization and um, there was a 70 year old elder woman, native elder woman. Um, I was asked to work with her by her social worker. Um, one of the first questions that she asked her social worker was, um, is he gay? And the social worker responded by saying, well, is that important? And the elder's response was, um, I don't wanna work with him. Now, my response to that is that, you know, um, I get it, I understand, but I also understand that even our, our elders in community really struggle with that acceptance. So the, again, that's, uh, that's a huge barrier that we need to break down. Um, so does anybody else wanna to respond to that? I'll just add that I think Angelique Day at University of Washington um, is developing some training materials for foster parents and she is, um, as far as I know, including two-spirit um, issues in that. Okay. So I have a question uh, from an audience again. So how could uh, MA or grad students get involved with stuff like this? So I imagine it's just everything that we're talking about. So does anybody, would anybody like to answer that question? Um, I always think, I always encourage my students. Um, I was an activist uh, before I was an academic and um, I'm still an activist, but um, I, I encourage my students who are passionate about this issue is to reach out and find the researchers that are working on these issues um, and ask what's missing as you develop your own research protocol uh, or your plan, your research plan. Um, and um, also to volunteer in the work, get trained as an advocate, get trained as somebody who can respond um, to people in crisis um, because that will inform your research. Uh, I know that for me, I worked at a rape crisis center for many years and um, I don't think that I would have the skill set to really do the kind of research that I like to do or want to do um, without that experience as an advocate. Um, so it's one of the first recommendations that I make to my students who are wanting to study marginalized populations, particularly around the issue of violence. But you also have to avoid burnout. Yes, yes, most definitely. Um, I'm not sure, I, I think this is really important and I'm not sure if any of you can answer this question or make a response to this statement. Um, many of our Two-Spirit relatives on mat um, are not allowed to participate in ceremonies and cultural gatherings as Suboxone uh, slash mat is seen as trading off from one form of addiction for another. Can any of you respond to that? I can a little bit. 
Um, I think it's a matter of education on one side of it is that Matt is not considered addictive. And some people, um, you know, think of it as harm reduction. But the thing is that, you know, with the opioids that exist now, if people don't use Matt, they'll most likely not be around. And if they're not around, then, you know, we can't offer them, you know, all the things we can offer them, including ceremony. And of course, you know, there's sovereignty and all those things that matter. Um, so I'm just saying one small piece of this challenging issue and I'll just let others respond if they want to. Okay, so I had to reread the question because I kind of didn't fully understand what you were asking, but um, I think that this is You've, it's a it's a really difficult um, question, and it's because even just with domestic violence um, shelters, um, there are very, there's like there are, where's the thing? Okay, so there's 574 federally recognized tribes in the U.S., but there's less than 60 tribally created or native centered uh, domestic violence shelters. So when it comes to treatment, you know, I feel like tribes and um, even cities surrounding tribes really need to adopt programs and form policies that do include two-spirit um, relatives because there, like I said earlier, there's a lack of support for us and um, that includes whether or not we're addicted or not. It's um, it's, it's hard to answer, very difficult question to answer. And I'm not really quite sure how to answer the, um, how they are excluded from ceremonies because they're on Suboxone. Um, I wouldn't really know why. I've never actually even heard of that happening. Um, could someone, uh, audience member wants to know, wants to know what MAT is. M-A-T. I don't really have a clue. <laughs> That's okay. Is that just, uh, I don't remember what the T stands for, but it's Medica okay. Medicated Assistance basically to get off opioids. Therapy? Medication. Therapy, therapy, yes. Okay. All right. So this question is coming from an indigenous trans woman on Facebook. You mentioned reaching out to help, helping to foster understanding with our elders regarding to spirit LGBTQ acceptance. Can you point to resources for us to help inform our elders? I and many others I know have been discriminated against by those elders in our communities that we love and respect for this reason. Well, um, well, for me, I know there's not a lot of resources out there. Um, and I think, you know, I believe that's one of the reasons why we need to have start having these conversations so we, that we can start to develop resources for specific, specifically for our community. Um, that's what I can say. Um, any of you all want to respond to that? Um, Lenny, when I just, when I read the question, the first thought that came to my mind was I can't think of any, but this is precisely why we're trying to do this web webinar right now is that the question really highlights a lot of the gaps in services for the for the trans uh, for our native trans brothers and sisters, and that puts a lot of the onus on a lot of us doing this work to really be intentional about these questions and 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 to be very sensitive to them as as we move forward. At least I am, and I, I keep thinking like that's something I didn't really have in my mind in terms of like moving forward, but I can certainly recognize that there's now a need for that because it's 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 very clear now 
But I think yeah. what we're, the conversation we're having right now is just, it, it just shows how much more um, resources like that are needed. And I, I can't honestly think of, think of any. I have anecdotal evidence of very good in specific individual elders, but not a, a resource training program. Mm -hmm. And I believe by us having these convers this conversation specifically, we're starting to um, show the gaps in it and what we need. And again, going back to what panelists have said is that it needs to be led by individuals who identify. And often sometimes we have other people who are speaking for us. And we need to create a safe space for our community um, to come forward and to address all of the violence, the issues, the struggles and challenges. But also, again, I'm always reminded by my friend um, who always says to me, well, Lenny, you know, you need to stop talking a lot about the bad things that are happening because we have good things that are happening in our community also. You know, we have our, we have the Montana Two-Spirit Gathering, we have the Bates Pow Wow. So I'm also reminded of that, but again, you know, this is the first time we've really even had a conversation like this. Does anybody else want to respond? I, I agree that we need to find some balance with also highlighting the strengths that we have. Um, I did work on one project that was about resilience among two-spirit women. I'm happy to share that article with people if they want me to email it to them. Um, but my overall message really was that even when people are struggling with either mental health challenges or substance use challenges, that there's still resilience. It doesn't mean that because you still have this problem, you're not resilient. And I think that's a message I think that we can all start spreading. Thank you so much, Jessica. So um, we are coming to the end of our uh, roundtable discussion. Um, again, I wanna invite everybody next week. We will also, again, SBI will be hosting another roundtable discussion on ceremony and skirt shaming. Um, so we'll be sending out a flyer soon for that. But um, I just want to thank every one of our panelists for being a part of this conversation. I'm so happy to know all of you. Um, I, I just, my, my heart goes out to all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having the discussions. And I think the, the next um, several webinars are just going to continue the conversation and, and really educate all of us about what we need to be doing to better address the humanity of Native Two-Spirit LGBTQ people. And I'm honored to have been invited. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Lenny. And I just want to say, like, I really appreciate the point that you're making that that Two-Spirit LGBTQ um, are, are they're, they're human. And, and that's the thing that, that we struggle against is the framing that we're simply identified through the sexuality portion. But I mean, when we think about our own traditions, like Navajo, Naglahe, it's about relationships. It's about fostering those good relationships that can go eat so easily into different communities. And that's what, that's the identification. It had nothing to do with the sexual, the sexual element. And that's what we're trying to get back to. So thank you, Lenny, for these thank conversations. You. Yes, thank you for being a part of it. So it's uh, 12.33 your time, 2.33 my time. So um, again, thank you so much for being here. And um, please join us next week if you can for our next conversation. Be well and safe, everyone.